Hi, I'm Lee Tushler with Design World and EE World. I'm here with Dan Carnavali from Eaton. And Dan is going to talk to us a little bit about surge protection. Dan, why don't, uh, we've got a kind of a cool demo behind us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where we are right now okay. and what you're going to show us. Thanks, Lee. So I'm Dan Carnavali here at Eaton's Power Systems Experience Center near Pittsburgh. And this is kind of a cool little demo. We're going to show you how surge protectors work and what happens if you don't have surge protection. So it's a it's kind of a go no go test. What we're going to do is we're going to you know normally the voltage in our outlet would be 120 volts. So what we're going to do is we're going to charge it up as if lightning hits the tree in your neighbor's yard and puts about 7000 volts into your house. So we have right now about almost 6.9 kV and we're going to discharge it. And frankly it's not all that exciting. Now why wasn't it exciting? Because we had this little guy on there, that's a little surge protector. I have a yellow plug here monitoring the voltage. I have the orange plug going to the light. So we're gonna do the same thing again. We'll charge it back up. And when it gets up to almost 7,000 volts, we'll discharge it again. I hate and when that happens. <laughs> I guess something was working there. So, yeah. yeah, how would you like that to be your computer or the brand new TV you just bought? Yeah, that would not be too good. No. What's inside those things are actually these little devices here called MOVs, metal oxide varistors. Think of them kind of like an electronic switch. So, if the voltage is normal, the switch stays off. But if the voltage goes high and if it exceeds a threshold, they turn on. And what they do is they connect your hot or your neutral conductor right to ground and they clamp that voltage and then when the voltage comes back down it turns off and everything goes back to normal and all of that happens within microseconds when a lightning strike hits your, your neighbor's house. Dan, you were talking about the MOVs but surge protectors sometimes incorporate other protection devices inside like fuses and other things. Can you talk to us about why you would do that? Yeah, so you know, you saw this surge protector and it actually worked and, we, and a lot of people ask me do I need to throw that away? Well, no, actually, if, it, if you actually have a surge event and it's very fast, these MOVs can take that and, and they are protected because of the thermal capacity of those MOVs. So what happens is if the voltage goes too high, you could have an over-voltage condition that might occur, let's say an open neutral, or maybe you apply um, on, a, on a commercial building, maybe you apply a 120-volt unit on a 480-volt system. Well, then what happens is these MOVs think that they're supposed to clamp every single cycle. An open neutral in your house might have a situation where you have 200 volts on half of your panel, and these things say, uh-oh, the voltage went high, i got to clamp it. Well, they start to get hot and hot and hot, and it's not that microsecond event anymore, it's many, many seconds. When they burn up, Historically, people have had house fires and things like that. So what happens is the new versions have internal fusing and other components that can actually help to make sure that that takes the system off, takes the surge protector off before it would actually burn and cause problems. Um, the other components you mentioned, there's other components in there. There's also other high frequency filters and other things that go along with it. So it's not just a clamp. It's also kind of a, a sine wave tracking device that takes off some of the high frequency noise as well. Interesting. Uh, Dan, can you tell us a little bit more about what the waveform actually looks like when it's hitting the MOV that we're triggering? Okay. But yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to see a picture of the waveforms. And what the waveforms will look like are the one where it clamped, uh, the voltage goes up to about 300 to 350 volts depending on you know, the event. And we saw about 7,000 volts come out of the surge generator. So at about 300 to 350 volts, that thing will clamp. And again, that's what your load would see. And your loads can see your loads can take up to about five times the normal peak voltage. 120 volts, the peak of the sine wave is 170. So they can take up to about five times of that. Um, so it does well within that. Um, in fact, it's about twice the normal peak. But what happens is when we don't have the surge protector in there, that waveform shows us where we go up to almost 6,000 volts or so. And what's interesting is the surge protector isn't in there. So what happens is the light bulb blows up. And during that first part of the waveform, as the light bulb burns up, you get about a two to 3,000 volt transient. And then instead of the voltage going to zero, we see that arc is extended for about 20 microseconds as the light bulb is blowing up. And it's kind of a really interesting waveform. The meter that we use there, we sample at six million samples per second. So we can see the waveforms and see what's going on. Hmm. And I understand it makes a difference where in the circuit the MOV is. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right. So let's say you put one of these surge protectors 
on your main panel. Let's say this is your panel in your home, okay? And you put this on that panel. Well, that's all well and good if lightning comes in, let's say the front door or from the utility side. And it comes in and it goes through your panel first and then goes to your load. But what if I had this at the other end of my house, maybe plugged into my stereo and TV? That would also be good for two reasons. One is the big one takes the brunt of the hit. The second one takes whatever's left over and makes it even better. The second part of that story is, let's say your stereo blows up, some power supply fails or something like that. Do you think that surge is going to come all the way back to this panel and get clamped before it damages your TV? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, we have a lot of stuff that goes on within our homes and within our commercial and industrial facilities that happens, and in fact, maybe as many as 80% of the surges happen within our homes. Not as big maybe as coming from the outside, but it's a little bit like electronic rust. It's like it's just beating on your equipment and then one day it just fails. Well Dan, is every surge protector the same and uh, how do you decide whether to install it and where to install it? Okay, so, so this is a good example here. We can see that this one has fewer MOVs and, and actually much smaller MOVs than this one. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, I've used the one here like 8,000 times and I haven't had it fail. So maybe that's good enough for certain events, but we may even need, you know, more MOVs in a, in a certain application. So really the number and size of MOVs dictates the life expectancy of that device. So that tells you how long you're gonna to need to use it. And, and in fact, some people overspecify that. I'll tell you, in, in some commercial facilities, I've seen really, really large surge protectors, but they buy one and expect that to take care of everything. And as we talked about earlier, it's better to have one up top and one down low to actually make your system better. Um, I think those devices might last a couple hundred years, then when the archaeologists dig up the buildings, it'll still work, but that doesn't really help you with its stuff downstream. Um, the installation part is probably as important, if not more important, than the device you buy, and here's why. It, you know, if you buy one like this and you plug it in, you don't have a choice of how you plug it in. If you buy one like this, there's a lead length on it, right? So what happens is when they test these, they make them all six inches to do a fair test between manufacturer A, B, and C. And then they say, okay, your device clamps at 400 volts. Well, in fact, that's six inches of cable that clamps at 400 volts. But for every inch of lead length, and so that what that means is if I install it and, and run it up like that, I might have 30 extra inches of cable. Well, that 30 inches of cable is gonna add about 600 volts of let through. So it's about 20 volts per inch of let through. And so if you think about it, that's a big deal. And what that means is everything fed out of your panel now is gonna see that maybe 1,000 volts. It's the 400 volts that it's supposed to clamp at plus the 600 volts extra. So if you can get it to mount it something like this or even like that, it's good. And a lot of people ask me the question, does it have to be at the top? And I'd say no, because if it's here, the bus bar inside there is so thick that it's actually almost the same top or bottom. And again, like we talked about earlier, you don't know if the surge is coming from the load or from the source. Interesting. Well, that's a good installation tip, yeah. Thank Thanks. you.